Kylie Olson from youdiscovermusic.com. It's Sunday night here at Rambling Man, and I'm joined by Warren Haynes. Hello. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Wonderful. You good? And uh, are you enjoying Rambling Man so far? Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. It's a nice festival, and i um, happy to be here. And uh, you're, you're headlining. How does that feel? I'm excited because uh, we haven't played that much in the UK, and it's, it's nice uh, to be part of something like this, you know, and uh, looking forward to the show. And you've got some other friends on the lineup as well. Oh, there's a lot of people Walter's here. here. Yeah, Walter, Walter Trout, Trout is here, and uh, Simo is a friend of ours, and the Kentucky Headhunters, and uh, Blackstone Cherry, and uh, my friend Bernie Marsden is here. There, you know, it's it's nice these kind of festivals where there's a bit of a reunion, you know. It's like a little happy family. Like a little family, a little warped family, <laughs> yeah. but a family nonetheless. And what do you think the importance of, of a festival like this one in particular is, where it's kind of that boutique-y feel? Well, it's nice to play to music fans who've never heard you before. That's a, that's a good yeah. thing. And it's also an opportunity for some of your fans that uh, aren't able to come to some of the, the other shows. They Maybe they can only make a festival here or a festival there, yeah. you know? Uh, and it's also good for the audience to discover music that they've never heard. So it's kind of a win-win in it that is. way. It is, yeah. It's a no-brainer. Um, so what else are you up to at the moment? Well, we just finished two and a half weeks in Europe and uh, going home to the States tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to uh, be taking a few days off and then going right back to work with Government Mules. So. And at the end of uh, the year, sometime in November, actually, we're going to start another Government Mule record that will hopefully come out next year. Oh, and, brilliant. And we'll be back here before you know it. And is it going to be similar sort of sounds, keeping it? Uh, you know, we try to do something different every time. And every time I go into the studio with something in mind, it winds up changing. So <laughs> who knows? I want to kind of go some places we've never gone, but mm -hmm. I also want to go back to the beginning of our earliest roots. So maybe some combination of those things. But again, all subject to change. You know? Yeah, exactly. And where are you going to record it? Well, we're still deciding. Uh, there's a couple of places in the Northeast that we like to work, but we're also considering New Orleans. So... Uh, We'll make that decision New shortly. Okay, that's interesting. Why there? A friend of mine has a beautiful studio there, and uh, he's been wanting us to come down and record there, and it's it's nice, and a great city. You know, yeah. I, I love New Orleans. Uh, it's I think it's America's richest musical city. Yeah, it is. Do you think the studio changes the sound of the record slightly? Like where you're recording it? Like, Do you think it has an influence on the sound? Yeah, I think each studio kind of has its own sound. Yeah. You know, it's not uh, drastic. You can make a, gre a great record in any good studio, but it's nice when you're in a studio that, that has an environment that uh, adds to, to the overall picture. Yeah, sure. And... Um, one of your many other fantastic bands that you've been in is the Allman Brothers. Why did you want to join them? Is that a silly question, <laughs> well, maybe? Well, uh, I just, yeah. You know, I joined the Allman Brothers in 1989. Yeah. I, I had been playing for about three years at that time with Dickie Betts, who was one of the founding members. Yeah. And uh, the Allman Brothers were one of my all-time favorite bands growing up. I never imagined that I would have an opportunity to be part of the band. And when they offered me the job in 1989, it was really for a reunion tour for one year. It was very successful, so we did another year, and then another year, and the next thing you know, I was in the band for 25 years, so <laughs> things happen. They do. What do you think the band's legacy is? Well, uh, you know, I can say, as someone who's not an original member, one of the greatest bands of all times, and the band that invented uh, Southern Rock, so to speak, you know, even though the Allman Brothers Band was never comfortable with the term Southern Rock, mm. uh, it became a category to describe bands that came after the Allman Brothers. But uh, the band mixed jazz and blues and rock music and soul music and country music together in a very unique way. And then you've got that incredible slide from Dwayne Norman. That yeah. was just the... The sort you know, of the icing on the cake almost. And it was such a shame because Dwayne Allman died before he turned 25. Yeah, so I nobody know. so nobody young. knew what he was really capable of, you know. 
uh, and when I started playing slide guitar at a young age, he was one of my very first influences. Was he? Know? Yeah. And do you think you've cracked it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm trying. <laughs> I think you have. I think you're there. Uh, to get on a nerdy note, um, Les Paul. Now, you play, what is it, the 50, you play a 58, is it? 59. 59. Uh, Most play the 58, though. Yeah, and my signature model is a combination of a 58 and a 59, which is a bit nerdy, as you say. But, uh, you know, for guitar geeks, the, the 59 neck feels better to me. Right, okay. Uh, and because that was what Dwayne played as well, wasn't it? Uh, uh, yes, uh, and uh, Dickie Betts had a 57 at one point, which is uh, beautiful, but I think people agree 57, 58, 59 are the kind of the holy grail of Les Pauls. And do you think the instrument does make a difference to the sound? Well, the sound of a, a, of a really good uh, 57 or 58 or 59 Les Paul is amazing. Yeah. It's like a, Stradivari a Stradivarius violin, mm -hmm. but it only benefits the music or the player if you're looking for a certain type of sound in a, in a band where there's a lot of distortion and overdriven sound every guitar kind of can sound the same right. but if you're going for a pure bell tone sort of quality there's no better sound right okay top tip there i remember that so um we're talking about it when you talk about some of your influences yeah can you talk me through them chronologically Chronologically, well, I started as a singer. I started singing yeah. first. Mm -hmm. James Brown was my first hero. Otis Redding, uh, The Four Tops, The Temptations, Sam and Dave. And eventually I started hearing The Beatles and The Rolling Stones. Uh, and then when I heard Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and Johnny Winter, that's when I wanted to play guitar. Right. But I was watching Ray Charles and B.B. King who were equally good at singing and playing and I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to do both of those things. So I kept singing and, and learned guitar, and uh, it's all been crazy ever since. And can you hear, hear them in your music? Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, I learned a long time ago, or at least I think I learned a long time ago, that no need to hide your influences. They're going to come through anyway, you know. Yeah. And so you should celebrate it and cherish it. And so with Government Mule, a lot of times we'll, we'll do special concerts where we're actually performing music by bands that influenced us. And it, I, it's good, it's fun for us, but it also turns the audience on to maybe music that they have never heard before. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I'm going to let you go, Warren. We've run out of time. It was lovely chatting to you. You as well. Thank you. My pleasure.